Imagine being trapped inside a roaring furnace, only there is no escape, and every breath pulls poison deeper into your lungs. That was the reality for early railroad crews, whose locomotives turned tunnels into deadly traps of invisible gases and suffocating heat. Dozens died in minutes, yet the tunnels kept being built. But what actually made these underground passages so quickly fatal? And why did no one stop? The answer dismantles everything you thought you knew about progress and survival. Coal-fired locomotives entering the darkness of a tunnel brought more than just noise and vibration. Every shovel full of coal fed the firebox, releasing a mix of smoke, steam, and invisible gases. The most dangerous of these was carbon monoxide, a gas with no color or smell, but a deadly ability to displace oxygen in the blood. Once inside the confined space of a tunnel, carbon monoxide did not drift away. It built up around the engine crew, binding to hemoglobin more than 200 times faster than oxygen. Within minutes, the blood's ability to carry oxygen dropped sharply. Crews felt their chests tighten, their vision blur, and their limbs grow heavy. Some collapsed at the throttle, never making it out. The heat was just as punishing. Early tunnel accounts describe conditions so extreme that metal tools became too hot to touch and sweat soaked through uniforms in seconds. Temperatures could soar above 150 degrees Fahrenheit as steam and exhaust collected overhead, trapped by rock and brick. In these conditions, every breath drew in not only scalding air, but also a cocktail of soot and toxic gases. The body's cooling system failed, heart rates spiked, and confusion set in. For engineers and firemen, the physical collapse came fast. Some reports from the Percocy Tunnel in Pennsylvania tell of workers and crews dropping as if struck down, their bodies found slumped beside their engines, or sprawled on the ballast, victims of an atmosphere turned lethal. There was no warning, no time for escape. The chemistry of combustion, the physics of heat, and the design of the tunnels combined to create a perfect trap. Once the train entered, the tunnel became a sealed chamber. The longer the passage, the more deadly the air became. Medical reports from later incidents like those at the St. Clair Tunnel described crews found without signs of struggle, their faces flushed and lips darkened by the lack of oxygen. In some cases, rescuers themselves were overcome as they tried to reach the fallen. The danger was not visible. It was in the very air that kept the engines running, turning every routine trip into a gamble with invisible poisons and lethal heat. Inside the tunnel, the world shrank to a few feet of swirling blackness. The moment a locomotive entered, its lamp designed to throw a beam dozens of yards ahead became useless. Smoke and soot rolled back from the engine, thickening with every turn of the wheels. Engineers reported that the beam from their headlamps collapsed to a faint, dirty glow, barely reaching the front of the engine. Some described the effect as hitting a wall. One step inside, and the outside world vanished behind a curtain of oily vapor. The soot did not just hang in the air. It clung to every surface, coating bricks and timbers, settling on faces and hands. Crews found themselves wiping their eyes with sleeves already blackened by coal dust, struggling to keep their bearings. The only way forward was by memory and touch. Some engineers kept a hand on the throttle, the other tracing along the cab's edge or the window frame, feeling for the familiar bumps and grooves. Eyewitness notes from the box tunnel in the 1850s report, lamps visible for no more than a yard ahead. In these conditions, even the sound of the engine changed, muffled by the dense atmosphere. The rails themselves would disappear under a blanket of ash. One composite account drawn from multiple engineer logs said I could not see the track, nor the tunnel walls, nor even my own hand at arm's length. I drove by the memory of the grade and the feel of the engine beneath me. Navigation became guesswork. Engineers relied on timing, counting the seconds it should take to clear the tunnel, hoping for the first hint of daylight. 
any unexpected stop or obstacle was a disaster waiting to happen. If a train stalled, the smoke thickened, and within minutes, the crew was left blind, choking, and disoriented. In the worst tunnels, like the original St. Clair or stretches beneath the Pennsylvanian hills, the darkness was so complete that even the faintest lamp seemed to be swallowed up. For those inside, it was not just the threat of suffocation or heat that haunted them. It was the knowledge that once the lamp failed and the smoke pressed in, they were driving blind, trusting their lives to instinct in a world where sight no longer mattered. Railroad executives in the mid-19th century faced a stark calculation every time a new route crossed a mountain or deep valley. Every additional foot of tunnel drove up costs, and every mile of track added to detour around an obstacle also added expense. The boardroom logic boiled down to one cold metric. How long could a tunnel be before it became not just expensive, but operationally hazardous? By the 1850s, a practical rule of thumb took hold among engineers. Tunnels longer than 1,000 feet posed risks that grew not by simple addition, but by steep escalation. This was not an arbitrary number. Reports from the era show that in tunnels under 1,000 feet, crews could often hold their breath or endure the smoke long enough to reach daylight. Beyond that distance, the odds shifted. The air grew thicker with each passing yard, and the buildup of carbon monoxide and heat crossed a threshold where survival was no longer a matter of endurance, but of luck. Still, the terrain left little choice. Mountain ranges like the Alleghenies or the Pennines forced routes through solid rock. And the cost of building switchbacks or wide detours could bankrupt a company before the first train ran. Engineering papers from the period laid out the economics in stark tables. A tunnel of 1,200 feet might cost $200,000 to bore, but a detour around the same peak could require five extra miles of track, doubling land acquisition costs and adding years to construction. For the North Pennsylvania Railroad, the Perkasie Tunnel cut straight through a ridge at just over 1,100 feet. The alternative, a winding detour, would have cost three times as much and delayed shipments by hours. Maps from the era show a patchwork of lines threading through valleys, but wherever a straight shot was possible, tunnels multiplied. The risk curve was clear to anyone reading the engineering journals. For every 100 feet beyond the 1,000-foot mark, the chance of crew incapacitation or equipment failure rose sharply. Yet the pressure to keep costs low and schedules fast meant that these dangers were quietly accepted. Company directors weighed the risk of lost crews against the certainty of lost profits. The balance tipped toward risk, and so the tunnels grew longer, even as the hazards inside became more severe. The result was a network where the technical limit of tunnel length collided with the economic realities of railroad expansion, setting the stage for the disasters that would soon follow. January 31, 1892. The St. Clair Tunnel stretched for over a mile beneath the St. Clair River, connecting Michigan and Ontario. That winter morning, a freight train entered the underwater bore, its engine burning hard through the darkness. About halfway in, a coupler gave way, splitting the train in two. The lead section rolled ahead, but several wagons and their crew were left behind, stranded in the heart of the tunnel. Standard procedure demanded the crew return for the wagons. Conductor George Hawthorne and brakeman Joseph Whalen stepped down into the swirling haze, lanterns in hand, walking back toward the stalled cars. The air was thick, heavier than usual, laced with the invisible threat of carbon monoxide. As they moved deeper, the exhaust from the idle engine filled the confined space mixing with the ever-present smoke. Minutes passed. The men slowed, then staggered. The last entries in the official report describe both men slumped against the side of a boxcar, faces flushed, lips darkened, lanterns extinguished. By the time rescuers reached them, the air had turned deadly. There were no signs of a struggle, no cries for help, 
just the quiet final collapse that carbon monoxide brings. The coroner's findings, entered into the St. Clair County records, stated simply that the cause was death by asphyxiation due to locomotive gases in a confined tunnel. The incident forced the railroad to reconsider its policies, but the tunnel remained in use, and the same risks continued for every crew that followed. The Hawthorne and Whalen tragedy was not an isolated case. In November 1897, another crew, a driver, a conductor, and a rear brakeman, perished in almost identical circumstances after re-entering the tunnel for separated wagons. Each time the cause was the same, carbon monoxide trapped in the underwater bore, building up far faster than air could clear it. These deaths were not the result of recklessness or error. They were the predictable outcome of a system that demanded men work in conditions where survival depended on luck and the hope that the air would last just a little longer. The official accident report now preserved in the National Archives stands as a record of what happened when engineering ambition outpaced the means to keep people safe. For the families of Hawthorne and Whalen, there was only the knowledge that the tunnel had claimed them in silence, with no warning but the weight of the air itself. The problem of deadly air inside railroad tunnels demanded more than small fixes. By the late 19th century, engineers began turning to the science of airflow, looking for ways to replace the stagnant, poison-laced atmosphere with fresh air. The first step was to borrow from the very methods used to dig the tunnels in the first place. During construction, vertical shafts had been sunk at intervals to remove spoil and provide access. Now these shafts were repurposed as lifelines, intended to channel fresh air down to the tracks and draw out the deadly gases rising from steam locomotives below. Engineering drawings from the era show a growing sophistication in shaft placement. Instead of random spacing, shafts were calculated to break up long stretches of tunnel into manageable sections. For example, the Box Tunnel in England, completed in 1841, used six shafts spaced along its 1.8-mile length, some plunging over 300 feet to reach the bore. These shafts were wide enough for both air and men, a design born from necessity as much as from theory. In Pennsylvania's Allegheny Tunnel, engineers installed steam pumps and mechanical fans at the shaft mouths, hoping to force air through the stagnant corridors. Reports from railroad journals in the 1870s describe how air movement was measured by the flutter of candle flames and the movement of smoke, long before precise instruments became standard. But even with improved ventilation, the limits of steam power inside tunnels became clear. By the 1890s, the St. Clair Tunnel, stretching over a mile beneath the river, became the proving ground for a new approach. Electric traction, once a laboratory curiosity, was tested in real-world conditions. In 1895, the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad ran electric locomotives through the Howard Street Tunnel in Baltimore, eliminating the source of smoke entirely. Crews reported that the difference was immediate and dramatic. Where steam engines had left the air thick and toxic, electric engines glided through in silence, the air behind them as clear as it was outside. The success of these pilot runs convinced railroad executives that the future of tunnel travel lay not just in better ventilation, but in removing combustion from the equation altogether. Calculations from the period suggested that for every 1,000 feet of tunnel, a shaft or other airflow mechanism was needed to keep air breathable. Yet as tunnels grew longer and more ambitious, even the best shafts struggled to keep up with the volume of smoke produced by ever larger locomotives. The arrival of electric traction was more the chai than a technical upgrade. It was a decisive break with the past. For the first time, engineers could design tunnels without the constant threat of invisible poisons lurking in the dark, and the focus shifted from surviving the journey to perfecting the ride itself. The transformation in tunnel safety did not happen overnight. For decades, the only barrier between crews and the lethal air was their own endurance. 
as the dangers became impossible to ignore, railroads began to rethink how they protected the men at the front of every train. The earliest step was in closing the locomotive cab. Before the 1880s, most engines ran with open cabs, just a roof and maybe a windbreak, offering little shelter from smoke or heat. By the late 19th century, fully enclosed cabs started appearing on new locomotives, first on lines with the worst tunnel reputations. These cabs, built from steel and glass, could be sealed tight as a train entered a tunnel, buying crews precious minutes before the air inside turned dangerous. By 1900, enclosed cabs were standard on most mainline engines in North America and Britain a quiet revolution that saved untold lives. Protection did not stop at the cab wall. As railroads faced mounting pressure from unions and accident inquests, they began to experiment with breathing gear for tunnel runs. The first attempts were crude, wet cloths tied over the nose and mouth, or sponges soaked in vinegar meant to filter out soot. These offered little real defense against carbon monoxide, but they set the stage for more sophisticated solutions. By the 1910s, some companies issued simple respirators for crews assigned to long tunnels, especially after high-profile fatalities in places like St. Clair and Cascade Tunnels. These early devices, little more than canisters of charcoal and lime, gave crews a fighting chance when smoke thickened or a train stalled. They were far from perfect, but for the first time, there was an acknowledgement that air inside a tunnel could turn deadly in moments. Rules changed too. After the mass asphyxiation at Percasy and repeated deaths in the St. Clair Tunnel, railroads began to codify new operating protocols. Chief among them was the no-stop policy. Trains were forbidden to halt inside tunnels except in absolute emergencies. Dispatchers were trained to stagger tunnel entries, ensuring that one train's exhaust would not poison the next crew to pass through. Rule books from the early 20th century spell out these procedures in stark language. No unscheduled stops, no re-entry for lost wagons, no exceptions. Inspectors checked compliance, and violations could mean dismissal. Institutional change moved slowly, but by the 1920s, the combination of enclosed cabs, basic breathing protection, and strict tunnel protocols had become the norm across most major railroads. For the first time, crews had tools and rules designed for their survival, not just the movement of freight. The human cost of tunnel travel, once accepted as unavoidable, was finally being addressed, not just by engineering, but by the expectation that every worker deserved to finish the journey alive. Rail tunnels today move millions safely, but every advance rides on lessons bought with lives. Modern ventilation standards and fail-safes exist because early crews proved what happens when progress outruns protection. As rail networks expand and new technologies emerge, safety remains a promise, not a guarantee. The next innovation still demands vigilance. Let me know your thoughts in the comments.